From Fox 8 Sports, this is the Overtime Podcast. From the Fox 8 Studios in New Orleans, this is the Fox 8 Overtime Podcast. I am your host, Sean Fazan. Riding next to me in shotgun, as he always does, is Andre Johnson Jr. Before we get into today's content, be sure to like, share, rate, review. If you are watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Get the bell notification for when we drop that fire content and boy do we have a banger of a show today on this hump day but first things first mr johnson how are you doing on this hump day i'm doing good you know we've had a lot of sports this weekend you know we ever sometimes it's a slow week where there's not much going on but we had lsu women over the weekend (laughs) tulane pro day yesterday lsu pro day today we had saints owners meetings just an abundance of stuff going on right and don't now. forget the pelicans it's been a crazy right. crazy week and we're only on wednesday so just just keep that in mind there's still a few <laughs> more days to go this week but as for our um big picture item today this was probably big enough in fact i thought about it, maybe jumping in with an emergency tuesday pod because of uh the news when it came from the saints out of the nfl owners meetings by the way i was at uh, lsu's pro day today and so was the saints contingent who were at the nfl owners meeting so they must have just came straight from orlando to baton rouge but out of that uh owners meetings it was near the end of dennis allen's uh, q a hit the breakfast that he does every year all the head coaches do it at the nfl owners meetings significant news with ryan ramchick to tell yes saints right tackle ryan ramchick it was reported by ian rapaport that he could potentially mm. miss the entire season because he won't be medically cleared. Now, Dennis Allen didn't go as far to say that, but he did acknowledge that the recovery for Ramchek has not gone as well as he had hoped. Ramchek missing nine games last year because of a knee injury, for including the last four games of the season. So a Saints offensive line that we already see as one of the weaker units on that team just lost arguably their best player. What was your takeaway from that? Well, first things first, I want to show you guys so – Watch Dennis Allen say it. Listen to what he says when it is revealed, as he is asked about Ryan Ramchak at the NFL owners' meetings, um, about the situation regarding Ramchak. Just kind of look at his face, listen to his words. Just check it out. I, I think it still remains to be seen. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't feel. Um, you know, at the combine a few weeks ago, I was feeling a lot better about it, um, and yet I don't know that I'm seeing as much progress as I was hoping to see. You know, at this point, so I think that still kind of remains to be seen. But here's the cool thing: we got plenty of time. Yeah, that's a coach concern. That's yeah. a coach that's probably past concerned and probably alarmed, and that's a coach that honestly is truthfully and realistically having to come with the come to the harsh reality that um there's a strong chance Ryan Ramchek has played his last game in black and gold. I just I don't know how you can twist this any other way. They don't want to go that far. I understand why he said there's still time and there's no reason to jump to any conclusions, but this was last month. Last month there was such an optimistic tone about the way his body has responded to this surgery. One month later, it's that much of a pivot, that much of a 180 in the the future and how it looks uh, not as not hasn't progressed as 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 well as they they would have liked the body hasn't responded to it so felt like they would be further along in this process you're already there just one month or whatever long it's been since he had that surgery that is a major 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 concern you saw the look on his face you yep. saw you heard his words there i mean this is past concern this is certainly alarming and as you said andre um the biggest need on this team was offensive line before the Ryan Ramchek now latest news. It's it's a gigantic need now when it comes to the Saints offensive line. They're going to have to draft one. They're going to have to draft one early. Probably may have to draft two and probably sign another one because you just you can't play around with that position. You who are your left and right tackles right now if Ryan Ramchek can't go? Who are they? James Hurst. Who, uh, James Hurst can play left tackle. He can play left guard. Who's your right tackle? Landon Young. Nick right. Saldaveri is a young guy we talked about, but he's going to be kicked inside to the guard position. Trevor Penning cannot be trusted at this point. There's even you know talks about him potentially moving inside, but they're, they're clearly going to figure that out as they go. But two tackles you don't have, you can't even pencil in a starter right now, and free agency is done. That is a major, major concern. That was a... 
uh, a major update in regards to the health of, of Ryan Ramchick. That was towards the end of that breakfast. I, yep. I wonder if he was maybe thinking maybe he'll be able to slide by without having <laughs> to, to reveal too much. But he was... Look, I give him credit for being honest, but honestly, that's a tough, tough break. And it really, you know, we did the seven and a half pot, uh, wins uh, over under on the yep. Saints in the last pod. And we got an interesting response to that. But the Ramshack news, man, that that might throw a little bit of a, of a wrinkle into a lot of people's thoughts in terms of, of can they go over that seven and a half threshold. And look, th- this is a... And they haven't done a whole lot in terms of big moves when it comes to free agency by design, as we learned uh, at the NFL owners meeting. So now there is a state of, well, what's going on? It's not just finding a, good, a, a quality right tackle as good as Ryan Ramchak. You just have to find a right tackle. What What is going on with the situation? Absolutely. And when I saw that, the first thing I thought was, man, this has got to have a huge impact on their draft process because before – we said offensive line was a need. Now it's a need in all caps, Must. bold, <laughs> italics, underlined, all of the above. And you mentioned drafting it early. They don't have a choice because, yeah. remember, <laughs> they've got pick 14. Yeah. Then they've got a second round pick. And as of right now, mm-hmm. they don't have an after their second rounder, they don't have another pick until yeah. the fifth round. So you're not going to be able to get a guy in the third or fourth. So now, obviously, we were talking about Brock Bowers, you know, potentially being a saint, maybe looking at some receivers, looking at some defensive ends, especially after the Chase Young injury dropped. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's almost penciled in, penned in, markered in. You have to go offensive line in that first round. Another thing I thought was a few days ago, I believe it was last week, maybe last Wednesday, last Thursday, we talked about the Saints free agency class as a whole. Mm-hmm. We kind of ranked them by, you know, importance. Yeah. I had uh, a guy I had at number four was, or excuse me, number five was Olisa Mika Yuda. Yuda, yeah. Now, I it kind of went under the radar because a lot of things were happening when mm-hmm. Yudo got drafted. But now he might wind up being one of the most important free agents the same sign just off of necessity can you pencil him in as a starter though i mean that's I, the question. they may have to but if that is the case man he's played right tackle in his career yeah so he, he's got experience doing it but olisa mika yudo was also a guy who was a backup for the majority yeah. of his career he yeah. was a backup in minnesota now he has started games he has started in a playoff game but right now just off of necessity he might be the guy who you're looking for to at right tackle if Ryan Ramchek is indeed unable to go. I mean, I'm just thinking of it right now. I mean, let's just say for the sake of argument, and this is a stretch. Yeah. If Penning can somehow figure it out at left guard, so it would be Hurst, Penning, McCoy, Ruiz, and Ali Udo. Is that how you say his name? Udo, Udo? Olisa Mika Udo. Udo. Okay. But if that doesn't work out, your next guard up is what? Uh, Sal DeVere? Yeah. Who's never played Who a game? Who didn't play last year? And if uh, Udo's not the guy, your next guy up is Landon Young, mm-hmm. who's been a, a basically a reserve. It's a scary situation. You're putting in a new offense. I mean, and I know this offense is predicated on not just linemen, but certain styles of linemen that can really move and, and can get athletic. They're a little bit lighter. Maybe that's why we haven't seen, to me, it would have been the first call when I heard about Ryan Ramsey because Andrew's Pete on the phone, but I guess it's not going to happen, or maybe it will happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Maybe that's why, but who knows? But they've got some serious uh, work to do there, and um, they're never going to present a state of panic when it comes to where they're at, especially in the offseason, but I, you can feel the level of concern on Dennis Allen's face there. And I, I think I think that concern is warranted. Oh, absolutely. And when you find out, I mean, I don't know how long Dennis Allen has known about it. It's kind of surprising that maybe yeah. they weren't, with him knowing that maybe they weren't a little more aggressive to get offensive mm-hmm. linemen in free agency. But the draft was already important. It's one of the most important parts of every team's uh, league calendar. But now it is so much more important for you to get a guy in the first or second round, or maybe they're scheming to trade their way back into maybe late second, third round, yeah. fourth round, because it's a big jump from two to fifth, second round to fifth round. You've got to get one of your guys early and give Derek Carr a chance back there because that, Derek yeah. Carr, was he was under pressure all last season, and he, you could see him frustrated at times. He mm-hmm. got into a shouting match with Eric McCoy at yeah. one point that kind of – was built around blocking, and he got sacked a lot last year. You're bringing in the new offensive coordinator who's going to want to use play action, who's going to want to get Derek Carr out the pocket. But the thing about the play action is 
you got to have time yeah. on a play action play. Time. Deep you got to have time yeah. to sell that run, get your head up. If they're rolling out, you got to have time to do that. And you can't get out that play action, look up, and there's a defensive end in your face. There's no doubt. And, and honestly, you're almost forced to pick a 14 right now, unless you pull off some kind of trade before the draft or some trade after the draft. I don't. I have to look at the, 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 the list of free agent tackles that are still available. Um, and not just that. Part of your projection has to be, can he start day one? I don't see how that can't be in the equation. It's some, like you've got to draft a guy. If you're going to draft a guy, given your current situation, and somewhere in the scouting report is on the field very quickly. Yep, and that's a tough ask for. It really anybody. is. I mean, we, we see how much it, it, it it's a challenge for offensive linemen. Look at the guy right now that may be changing positions. I mean, we don't know if that's going to happen with Trevor Penning. But nonetheless, um, not the perfect situation, not the ideal situation the Saints find themselves in Definitely as we not. get – near the end of March, into April. I mean, we got the list yesterday from the Saints about the important dates coming up. Uh, OTA start in May. I mean, it's it's not that far away, so it's about to get here. And it's about to get here real quick. But, Andre, I said I was at um, LSU's Pro Day today. All the Saints coaches were there. All 32 of them were there today. Absolutely, and that's what the big thing was. As we talk about the draft and as we talk about mm -hmm. important dates, Pro Day is one of those important dates, especially when you're talking about Jaden Daniels, the Heisman winner, LSU quarterback, mm -hmm. out there with his guys, out there with Brian Thomas, Malik Neighbors. Now, when you guys were on your way back from Baton Rouge, we were watching a little bit of TV, NFL mm -hmm. Network, whatever, and a lot of guys were gushing about how well Jaden Daniels looked in that pro day. You were there. Mm -hmm. I saw a good amount of it because I was watching as well. I don't know if I saw what they saw, but I'm interested to see what you saw first. Okay, well, first and foremost, the most important thing he did it had nothing to do with the field. It was when I saw him, he was originally in kind of a um, like black sweatpants and a black hoodie, and then he he uh, put on some shorts to do the the, the on field workout, and he looked he looked bigger, it, it specifically in his legs. He looked he definitely looked bigger, That's and. A big um, deal. And he, we got the official results, and this is not faking it because all 32 teams were there. He checked in at 210 pounds. That is, I can't, I can't begin to tell you how important that is. I can't begin to tell you how many teams were looking at his actual weight and think and were terrified because if he checked in at 195, the quarterbacks under 200 do not last in the NFL. They just mm -hmm. don't. And that would have been a huge red flag if he had all this time to gain the weight and he hadn't done so. So that is probably the biggest concern checked off. But I've got to tell you, man, I don't know if it was that maybe they were afraid to get critical because they were in they were inside the LSU facility. That was not an A plus workout. I'm telling you, that was not an A plus workout. It was good. It was not phenomenal. It was not flawless. He did not put on a show. It was good. It was solid. I would give it a solid B to a B plus. I'm gonna tell you though, man, he's a little rusty at sometimes. I mean, he he missed Brian Thomas on a deep sale. He missed Brian Thomas on a deep comeback. He missed Chris Hilton on a deep seven route. He overthrew him on a nine route. There was a throw in the middle of the field that wasn't a that wasn't a, a miss, but it was off target. There was another drop that he uh, missed. And now he now look, those were the ones that I think it was five or six incompletions in a twenty minute session. So clearly he had some connections as well. He hit neighbors a couple mm -hmm. times deep. Uh, he layered a nice ball to neighbors on a deep over route. That was a great. Uh, deep seven route to uh, to Chris Hilton that I think he was able to kind of catch it and he got the college foot down. He didn't get two feet down, but that was on yeah. the receiver. That was not on Jaden. So it was good. Don't get me wrong. He didn't hurt himself with his performance. But for everyone out there saying it was a phenomenal workout, I, I would I would be careful with that adjective. I thought it was more like a B plus workout because I wasn't expecting that many misses. And it's been a while since he worked with those guys. You understand that. Um, and you can tell he was really where he did some under center stuff. He did some play action stuff. Um, and he was trying to hit three levels of the field. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, um, and it was teardrop. There were power throws. There were drive throws. There were kind of layered throws. So he did a little bit of everything. Um, and it was good. And it was very good. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't the greatest pro day I'd ever, I had ever seen uh, from an LSU quarterback. But I don't think he hurt himself. Uh, I think he's a guy that if you had him at, if he was the second overall player, if Washington wanted him, I don't think anything you saw today would distract you or uh, alarm you. I think if uh, if you're New England, you had him on there, and he's available at, at number three, you would probably uh, still take him based off today's performance. So all in all, it was a good day for Jaden Daniels. I just I wouldn't call it a phenomenal workout. But one player that I watched, and we, we talked about this earlier, was look, Malik Neighbors ran a 4-3-5. It was awesome. He killed it. And Jaden Daniels really interacts with his teammates well, which I know, I know, 
all 32 teams were looking at, how much right. he interacted with those guys, and they loved it. The fact that he wore the number three shirt for Greg Brooks, that's going to go a long way just with his interaction and how his teammates love him. Um, but back to Brian Thomas. He might be available at 14. And Dennis mm-hmm. Allen did say this team is in the market for pass catchers. Could be a receiver. Could be a tight end. Six foot three. Runs a four three. As a matter of fact, I got to look at the list again to see what his official measurement was in terms of height. But that's a big play guy with a big body and a big catch radius. So just just throwing that out there because I oh, thought well, okay. I thought he did uh, pretty well as well. He had one drop, I thought. But I think overall he had a decent day as well. But all in all, look, LSU's pro day. Um it is what it is. It's it's a major stop in the NFL pre-draft circuit because they always have a ton of athletes. And this year they had one of the biggest draws of the entire pre-draft circuit. And that was Jaden Daniels. And I wouldn't say he disappointed, but I wouldn't say it was his best day of work either. You know, I, I tend to be a bit of a hater when it comes to pro <laughs> days in general. Because especially when you're talking about a guy like Jaden Daniels, we have, what, three, four years of film on right. Jaden Daniels. And so I, I try not to put too much weight on too. seeing these guys go out there for a combines mm-hmm. and pro days, not just Jaden, but any quarterback and, you know, see them throwing in a T-shirt and shorts against no defense. Mm-hmm. Now, with that being said, yeah, Jaden did miss a few throws that you would hope he would make. He missed a few deep passes. There were a few intermediate passes mm-hmm. that he did complete, but the placement was a little off. There was one where guy kind of made an incredible jump and catch, mm. but the reason he had to make the jump and catch yeah. is because the ball was high, maybe a few balls behind guys, but Jaden Daniels is almost playing with house money. Jaden Daniels yeah. is not going to drop to 27 because no he had a few off-target balls in the pro day, and to me, the most interesting part was, you know, that he had six interviews. They had a lot of guys coming in to talk to Jaden Daniels from different teams, and if I'm Jaden Daniels, it seems like he's really getting penciled in to kind of that second and third pick. Mm -hmm. Second pick being the Washington Commanders, the third pick being the New England Patriots. If I'm Jaden Daniels, I am begging, pleading for Washington to come get me. Washington is not a bad situation at all. If you're going to walk into uh, Cliff uh, Kingsbury. Yeah, he was. they they, they interacted a lot today. He was there today. And he even mentioned them, uh, Jaden did, in the post-game or post-game press conference, the Mm -hmm. uh, post-pro day workout press conference. He talked about Cliff Kingsbury and how cool it would be to work under a guy who once upon a time helped kind of Kyler Murray kind of figure this thing out mm-hmm. in the league. And then when you look at the weapons on that offense, you've got Terry McLaurin, a guy who's been a talented receiver mm-hmm. in the NFL. You've got Jahan Dotson, a talented young guy. Mm-hmm. Austin Eckler, his best days may be behind him, but he's still a veteran who can do some damage in the receiving game. Mm-hmm. Brian Robinson. Running back had a very, mm-hmm. very good year last year. Antonio Gibson was actually supposed to be the starter, and he kind of snatched that job from him. Then you've got another veteran in uh, Zach Ertz playing tight end. That's a solid offense. Cliff Kingsbury as your offensive coordinator. You bring in Jaden. He'll probably wind up being your day one starter. It's not a bad situation to walk into compared to New England, which I think if it's not the worst situation for a quarterback to walk into – it's definitely one of the worst situations for a young quarterback who, again, is probably going to be expected, if not to start day one, to start and yeah. play very early. They don't have many weapons at all out there in New England. They've got a head coach at uh, Mayo who's more of a defensive guy. And his so. first time being a head coach, whereas Dan Quinn, he's, he's taking a team to a Super Bowl. Exactly. 28-3. So if I'm Jaden Daniels, <laughs> I'm hoping my workout today really, really impressed the Washington t- Commanders because – that is a much better location to find yourself in than New England. And it's kind of trending in that direction. In fact, I mean, the guy he was kind of neck and neck with at two, I mean, it's almost it's almost like now it's a battle of three or four when it comes to Drake May and J.J. McCarthy. Um, certainly feels like, and look, you never know when, on these draft boards, you never know what kind of deals have been. Certainly feels like it's close to a consensus. I mean, the overall consensus is Caleb's going one, Caleb yeah. Williams. It's getting closer and closer to being just about expected that Jane Daniels would go number two. And it's not a bad coordinator to work with. He's gonna he's very QB friendly. I know it towards the end of his stay in Arizona, him and Kyler kind of had some issues. But if Jaden's a student of the game, and certainly if you look at the way he his game just took a leap from his fourth his sec, first year at LSU to his second year, so his fourth year in college to his fifth year in college, um, you can't say he hasn't studied. And he's he's a progression reader. In other words, you see one two, three, making the reads. You don't, you don't even see that with Caleb Williams, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. You see that 
more with Jaden than probably any quarterback in this class that with, with that kind of proficiency. So, again, you got all this tape to look at Jaden. You got a, a, a near flawless uh, 2023 college football season with the exception of maybe the Florida State game. Yeah. It was dang near perfect. So um, a B-plus, as I would call it, uh, pro day is not going to hurt him. He's going to be just fine. And I, at this point, I would expect him to be – the number two overall pick in this draft. Another quarterback we got to see, you and I both did, out at the Saints facility, uh, was Michael Pratt in, in the Tulane Pro Day. You stayed there for the in- entirety of it. I watched a little bit of the throwing session. What did you think of Michael Pratt? Now, Michael Pratt, when you talk about him, he's not going to necessarily blow you away. And he mm-hmm. kind of talked about this afterwards. He's not going to blow you away with his speed. Mm-hmm. He's not going to blow you away with his arm. What he really wants teams to see is his ability to be a winner mm-hmm. and his ability to be a leader. And that's what he showed a lot at Tulane. Remember, it's it's fun to talk about Tulane now because they're up. They beat Caleb Williams mm-hmm. in the yeah. bowl game. Like They won 12 games. But the year before they won 12 games, they were a two-win Oof. football team. Yeah. They went from a two-win team to a 12-year team in one year. And Tulane's Michael Pratt is a lot of the reasons why that happened. No doubt. Michael Pratt, from a leadership perspective, and I found it interesting. I asked every single teammate that was there that they allowed us to talk to about Michael Pratt. And each one of them mentioned, they didn't talk about him on the field, they mentioned his leadership. Cornerback Jarius Monroe even went as far to say, not only was he a great leader, he taught me how to lead. Mm -hmm. He taught me how to get other guys to go along with me, you know, and he learned that from the Ty J Spears and the Dorian Williams and mm-hmm. some of the guys who were drafted from Tulane last year. So Michael Pratt's a very interesting case because he's being projected kind of in that third, fourth round yeah, I was thinking that. area, that day, a day two guy. And when you look at his throwing session, it was about what you would expect. Mm-hmm. He didn't do anything crazy, nothing rolling out, not, no 60-yard bomb while throwing, you know, off his back foot. He made a lot of short well-timed, intermediate-type passes. They wanted to see him go through his progressions. He did that. He threw a few deep passes. Mm -hmm. I think he missed on one deep ball, but all the other ones were caught. I believe outside, not counting the drops, because there were a few drops, he only really missed about one or two passes yesterday. So it was a really good pro day from Pratt. He's going to compete. He's going to be in that mid-range category. You're going to draft him. You're not drafting Michael Pratt to come in and start day one. You're drafting Michael Pratt to learn be a backup but that doesn't always mean that you're stuck in that role because no. we've seen Dak Prescott yeah. drafted in the fourth round we've Kirk seen Cousins Kirk Cousins I believe Russell Wilson was drafted yeah. in the third round so we've seen guys like that kind of get drafted get in the building and you're like oh man hold up we might have something here and there's a he's different than a lot of quarterbacks in that I think he he kind of embraces like this He's rugged. Like he, mm-hmm. he he's not smooth. He's kind of a rugged type player, rugged type quarterback. He's not afraid to uh to, to take a hit. He's not he's not afraid when he runs to uh to to dip his shoulder. And that's not always the smartest thing in the world. I know one time he took a hit and hurt his calf and it was, certainly was not uh the best thing in the world, but there's a grittiness to him that I think some teams are going to find endearing. And I'm with you. I think he's going to fall somewhere between rounds three and five. I'm, I'm probably leaning more now towards a, a day three pick, so probably more of a fourth-round pick. Um, but he's a guy and he's a guy whose who's special, special attributes are probably going to show up and get magnified when he's on the field with his teammates in an 11-on-11 session, whether that's a training camp practice or a preseason game or whatever the case may be. He's not going to be a starter in the NFL next year, barring any kind of injury. But he's a guy, when you get in the program, oh, okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, man, I really like that. man. I really, and then all of a sudden he gets his opportunity and everybody just kind of rallies around him. So I think I think Pratt's got a future in the NFL. I don't know if he'll ever be a starter, but I do think he's a guy that he kind of hangs around long enough. And a team, You know, he's not bad. Maybe maybe in a, in, in a situation where he's got to start, we would trust that guy, a la you know, Gardner Minshew or something yep. like that. So um, uh, I thought it was a good pro day. It was at, it was at the Saints facility because it was a rainy day and it was uh, indoor. The Saints are doing all kinds of stuff, uh, some renovations down there. So it was a little bit of an interesting mix, but they had a lot of – a lot of guys, a lot of uh, teams represented over there as well. Definitely, and one thing about Pratt, he's got guts. You know, that's what it is. I right. think about the going in and playing that game against USC. Caleb Williams is mm-hmm. fresh off a of Heisman. You're looking at USC, the Trojans, yeah. and you're looking at 
the two lane green wave. Mm -hmm. A lot of people counted two lane out of that game. A lot of people assumed two lane as a team that just won two games the year prior. They were just happy to be there. Yeah. They were just happy to be in the conversation the with Caleb Williams, a guy who's going to be the number one pick, the Heisman winner. Mm -hmm. He's done all of these incredible things. And Michael Pratt, he stepped up and he made huge plays in that game. Ty J. Spears was great in that game. Oh, the throw to win and it was unbelievable. Exactly. And they scored a lot of points. That was a high scoring yeah. game. You would have never thought that. The Tulane Green Wave would win a shootout against Caleb Williams and they the did. USC Trojans. And it, and it was not fluky. I mean, they, they fair and square, they came back and they beat them. They took it to them, and it was a, a fantastic game. And honestly, um, you know, we thought that Pratt might have been done at Tulane after that because, you know, yeah. NIL comes into play, and I know there were some big-time schools throwing some money at him to come, and he ended up staying at Tulane. I know Tulane ponied up a little bit there, but – um, he finished out his legacy uptown with, and I, you said it in your piece, and I thought it was a decent line. I mean, I thought I thought it was a head accuracy. I, I think he's the best quarterback in Tulane football history. Definitely. I mean, he's going to be the first one, which is almost crazy to say, because we've seen Tulane quarterbacks in the league, but he'll be the first Tulane quarterback drafted since J.P. Lossman back in 2004. I was nine years old in 2004. Yeah, they had, I remember I'm J.P. 29 Lossman. now. I remember J.P. Lossman. Patrick Ramsey and Sean King. They had a run there in the late 90s, early 2000s, where they had a couple guys that was able to do anything. None of, none of them really – Sean King had a decent little run in the pros, but Ramsey had a couple starts and Lossman did too, but none of them really panned out to become superstars. But that would be interesting if he can certainly uh, pick up the legacy and uh, have himself a nice uh, professional – career man we covered a lot today we, we really did. did cover a lot we had ram check we had lsu pro day Tulane pro day that was just from the last time we were here <laughs> right. so just the last two and we kept it under 30 minutes yeah. look at us how about that well anything else one last thing about Tulane. while we're on the subject it's interesting we talked to john sumrall who obviously didn't really get to coach michael pratt because mm -hmm. he just got there willie fritz was the guy who coached pratt John Sumrall, though, he called this Pro Day kind of free marketing, free mm -hmm. advertising for so many teams to be in the building watching. We, you know, we saw the, the Lions, the Vikings, the Saints, so many different teams in there watching the Tulane players. You're going to have guys drafted, maybe more Tulane guys in this draft mm -hmm. than in any draft in recent history. And that's all a part of building that program up. Better days or good days uptown, no doubt about it. I like that new coach, John Sumrall, yeah. as well. All right. Andre Johnson Jr., I am Sean Fazan. We'll catch you guys next time on Overtime.